Hi everyone, and today we are going to switch things up for a bit, since it seems like the Book of Invasions did not go over well. I decided to switch from that to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now, before I read this, we got to understand Bram Stoker was a bit classist and to a certain degree he really did believe England, the Church of England, all these groups did have a certain priority over other people. So, and we also got to remember, he was part of this group that would be a, a huge part of the Romantic movement, and if not Romantic movement, proto-romanticism. And, and while... And alongside that, Dracula itself is in this weird place as far as, like, actual vampire literature goes. Yes, it's the bedrock of, like, our modern image of vampirism, but uh, it also has enough of its own, like, vampire lore, weaknesses, strengths, all this stuff, and abilities that... Uh, that really didn't make it into mainstream media, that it's still very much its own thing. And with all that out of the way, let's begin. Now, now uh, like I said, oh, and despite how movies portray this, uh, it's very much, the book itself very much has its own style that may or may not translate well into recording, so bear that in mind. A who? Chapter 1. Jonathan Harker's Journal Kept in Shorthand. May 3rd Bistritz. Left Munich at 8.35 p.m. on the 1st of May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6.46, but train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place from the glimpse which I got from the train. And the little I could walk through the streets, I feared to go very far from the station as we arrived late and would start as near the correct time as possible. The impression I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east. The most western of splendid bridges over the Danube. Which is here of noble width and depth, took us among the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time and came after an night fall to Klausenberg. Here I stopped for the night at the Hotel Royale. I had for dinner, or rather supper, a chicken done up some way with red pepper, which which was very good but thirsty. Give recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter and he and he said it was called Paprika Hindel. And that, as it was a national dish, I should be able to get anywhere along the Carpathians. I found my smattering of German very useful here. Indeed, I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having had some time at my disposal when in London, 
I had visited the British Museum and made search along the books and maps in the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fail to have some importance in dealing with the nobleman of that country. I find that the district he named in the extreme east of the country just on the borders of three states, Transylvania, Moldavia, and Bukovina, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe, I was not able to light on any map or work giving the exact locality of the Castle Dracula. As there are no maps of this country as yet to compare with our own Ordnance Survey maps. But I found that Bistritz, the town named by Count Dracula, is a very fairly well-known place. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my travels with Mina. In the population of Transylvania, there are four distinct nationalities. Saxons in the south, and mixed with them the Wallachs, who are the descendants of the Dacians, Magyars in the west, and the Sizzics in the east and north. I am going among the latter who claim to be descended from Attila and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the 11th century, they found the Huns settled in. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians, as it were the center of some sort of imaginative whirlpool, if so may stay be if so, my stay may be very interesting. I must ask the count all about them. I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have had something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my car fit, and was still thirsty. Towards the morning, I slept and was awakened by the continuous knock at my door, so I guess I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika and a sour porridge of maize flour, which they said was mamaliga, an eggplant stuff with horse meat. A very excellent dish which they call emplata. Give recipe for this also. I had to hurry breakfast for the train star a little before eight, or rather ought, ought to have done so, for after rushing to the station at 7.30, I had to sit at the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go, the more unpunctual are the trains. All day long, we seemed to dawdle through a country which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw low towns or castles on the tops of steep hills, such as we see in the old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams which seemed from the wide stony margin on each side of them to be subject to great floods. It takes a lot of water and running strong to sweep the outside edge of a river clear. At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds, and all sorts of attire. Some of them were just like the peasants at home, or those I saw coming through France and Germany. With short jackets and round hats and homemade trousers, the others were very picturesque. The, woman, the women looked pretty, 
except when you got near them. But they were very clumsy about the waist. They ha had uh, all full white sleeves of some kind or other, and most of them had big belts with lots of strips of something fluttering from the dresses and like from from them like the dresses in a ballet. But of course, there were petticoats under them. The strangest figures we saw were were the Slavoks, with their big cowboy hats, great baggy, dirty white trousers, white linen shirts, and enormous heavy leather belts nearly a foot wide, all studded over with brass nails. They wore high boots with the trousers tucked into them and had long black hair and heavy black mustaches. They are very picturesque, but do not look proposing. Proposing. On the, on the stage, they would be set down at once. They are, however, I'm told, very harmless and rather wanting and natural self-assertion. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz, which is a very interesting old place, being practically on the frontier, for the Borgo Pass leads from it into Bukovina. It had has had a very stormy existence, and it certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on fire separate, five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks and lost 13,000 people, the casualties of war proper, being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel, which I found to be very, very delightful. To be thoroughly old-fashioned, for of course I wanted to see all I could of the ways of the country I was evidently expected. For when I got near the door, I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress, white undergarment with long double apron, front and back of colored stuff fitting up almost too tight for modesty. When I came close, she bowed and said, The Herr Englishman? Yes, I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave me me some message to an elderly man in white shirt, shirt sleeves who had followed her to the door. He went, but immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, the diligence will start for Bukovina, a place on it, is kept for you at the Borgo Pass. My carriage will await you and will bring you to me. I trust that your journey from London has been a happy one and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. May 4th. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count directing me to secure the best place on the coach for me, but on making a quite inquiry as to details, he seemed somewhat re reticent and pretended that he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up to then he had understood it perfectly, at least he answered my questions exactly as if he did. He and his wife, the old lady who had 
We see me look at each other and frighten our way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in a letter, and that was all he knew. Why ask him if he knew Count Dracula, and could tell me anything of his castle, both he and his wife crossed themselves, and saying that they knew nothing at all, simply refused to speak further. It was so near the time of starting that I had no time to ask anyone else, for it was all very mysterious and not by any means comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a very hysterical way, Must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost her grip of what German she knew, and mixed it all up with some other language, which I did not know at all. I was just able to follow her by asking many questions. When I told her I must go off once and I was gauge, engaged on important business, she asked again, Do you know what day it is? I answered, sir, that was the 4th of May. She shook her head and said again, Oh, yes, I know that. I know that. But do you know what day it is? On my saying that I did not understand, she went on. It is the eve of St. George's Day. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you are going and what you are going to? She was in such evident distress that I tried to comfort her, but without effect. Finally, she went down on her knees and implored me not to go, at least to wait a day or two before starting. It was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel com comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could not uh, allow anything to interfere with it. I therefore tried to raise her up and say as gravely as I could that I thanked her, but my duty was imperative, and that I must go. She then rose and dried her eyes, taking crucifix from her neck, offered it to me. I did not know what to do. As an English churchman, I have been taught to regard such things as in some measure idolatrous. And yet it seemed so ungracious to refuse an old lady meaning so well. And such a state of mind. She saw, I suppose, the dial on my face, for she put the rosary around my neck and said, For your mother's sake. And went on out of the room. I am writing up this part of the diary whilst I am waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still around my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear or the many ghostly traditions of this place, or the crucifix itself, I do not know, but I'm not feeling nearly as easy in my mind as usual. If this book should ever reach Mina before I do, let bring my goodbye. Here comes the coach. Fifth of May, the castle. The gray of the morning has passed, and the sun is high over the distant horizon which seems jagged, whether with trees or hills, I know not. For it is so far off that big things and low are mixed. I am not sleepy, and as I am not to be called till I awake, naturally I write till sleep comes. There are many odd things to put down, and less who reads them may fancy that I dined too well before I left Bistritz. Let me put down my dinner exactly. I donned, I dined on what they called robber steak. Bits of bacon, onion, and beef seasoned with red pepper and strung on sticks and roasted over the fire in the simple style of London's cat meat. The wine was golden medisk, which 
produces a queer sting on the tongue, which is, however, not disagreeable. I had only a couple of glasses of this and nothing else. When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken a seat, and I saw him talking with the landlady. They were evidently talking of me, for every now and then they looked at me, and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door, which they called called by a name meaning word-bearer, came and listened and then looked at me, most of them pityingly. I could hear a lot of words, often repeated queer words, for there were many nationalities in the crowd, so I quietly got my polyglot dictionary from my bag and looked them out. I must say they were not cheering to me, for amongst them was or dog, Satan, Polko, Hell, Stregosia, which Rolock and Losk both mean the same thing, one being Slavic and the other Serbian, for something that is either werewolf or vampire. I must ask the Count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the end door, which had by this time swelled to a considerable size, all my made sign of the cross and passenger. All made sign of the cross and point two fingers towards me with some difficulty. I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He could not answer at first on learning that I was English. He explained to me it was a charm or a guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me. Just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man. But everyone seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I, c that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse which I had of the inn-yard and its crowd of picturesque figures, all crossing themselves as they stood round the wide archway with its background of rich foliage of oleander and orange trees and green tubs clustered in the center of the yard. Then our, then our driver, whose white linen Drawers covered the whole front of the boxy, gotze, they called them, cracked his big whip over his four small horses, which ran abreast, and we set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears and the beauty of the scene as we drove along. Although I had known the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to throw off, throw them off so easily. Before us lay green sloping land full of forests and woods, with here and there steep hills crowned with clumps of trees or with farmhouses. The blank gavel and to the road. There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossom, apple plum, pear, cherry, and as we drove by, I could see the green grass under the trees spring sprinkled with fallen petals and or amongst the green hills of what they call here the Middle Land. Ran the road, losing itself as if swept round the grassy curve or was shut out by the staggering ends of pine woods which here and there ran down the hill to fly over with feverish haste. I could not understand then what the, the, that haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time and reaching Borgo Pront. I was told that this road is in summertime excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. 
in the, this respect, it is different from the general run of roads in the Park Carpathians. For it is an old tradition that they are not kept in too good order. Of all the hospitals would not repair them lest the Turk should think they were preparing to bring in foreign troops, and so hasten the war which was already really at loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of the Middleland rose mighty slopes of force up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves right and left of us they towered with the afternoon sun falling full upon them and bringing out all the glorious colors of this beautiful range. Deep blue and purple in the shadows of the pe peaks green, jagged and brown, where grass and rock mingle and with perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags. How these were themselves lost in the distance, where the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, through which, as the sun began sinking, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling wire. One of my companions touched my arm, swept around the base of a hill, and opened up the lofty snow covered peak of a mountain which seemed as we round our serpentine way to be right before us, look, it's Stingig's got seat, and he crossed himself reverently. As we wound our endless ways, and the sun sank lower and lower, behind us the shadows of the evening began to creep around us. This was emphasized by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset and seemed to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed Czechs and Slovaks on picturesque attire, but I noticed that Gauter was painfully prevalent. By the roadside were many crosses, and as we swept by, my companions all crossed themselves. Here and there was a peasant man or woman kneeling before a shrine, who did not even turn around as we approached, but seemed so, so that seemed in the self surrender of devotion to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me, for instance, havericks in the trees, and here and there were very beautiful masses of weeping birch their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now again we pass a liter wagon, the ordinary peasant carts with its long snake-like vertebra calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this, there were sure to be seated quite a group of homecoming peasants, the Czechs with their white and the Slovaks with their colored sheepskin, the latter carrying lance fashion, their long staves with axe at end. As the evening fell, began to get very cold, and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistance. The gloom of the trees, oak, beech, and pine, though in the valleys which ran deep between the spurs of the hill as we ascended through the pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late lying snow. Sometimes as the road was cut through the pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing, down upon us great masses of grayness, which here and there bestrewed the trees, produced a peculiar re weird solemn effect which carried on the thoughts and grim fancies 
engendered earlier in the evening. When the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds which amongst the Carpathians seemed to win seriously, ceaselessly through the valleys, sometimes the hills were so steep and dis that despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wish to get down and walk up them as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, no, he said, you must not walk here, the dogs are too fierce. And then he added, with what he evidently meant for groom pleasantly, he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest. And you have had enough of such matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was a moment's pause to light his lamp. When it grew dark, there seemed to be a excitement amongst the passengers as they kept speaking to him, one after other, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercilessly with his long whip and with wild cries of encouragement urge them on to further exertions. Then through the darkness I could see sorts of patch of gray light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on, the road grew more level, and we appeared to fl fly along. Then the mountain seemed to come nearer to us each side, and to frown down upon us. We were entering the Borgo Pass. One by one, several passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with earnestness which would take no denial these were certainly of an odd very kind. They each was given simple good faith, with kindly words and a blessing, and that strange mixture of fear-bearing movements which I had seen outside the hotel at Bistritz. The sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. Then as we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers craning over the edge of the coach peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or, t or be expected. But though I had asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest explanation. The state of excitement kept on for some little time. And at last we saw before us the pass opening out on the eastern side. There were dark rolling clouds overhead and the air heavy oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had separated two atmospheres. And that now we had gone to the thunderous one. I was now myself looking out for the conveyance, which was to take me to the Count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness. But all was dark, only light was the flickering rays of our lamps, in which the steam from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could see now the sandy road lying white before us. But there was on it no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking what I had best do. When the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others something which I could hardly hear, it was spoken so quietly and so low a tone I thought was an hour less than the time. The turning to me, he said in German, worse than my own. There is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bugavina and re 
return tomorrow or the next day. Bear the next day. While he's speaking, the horses began to neigh and snore and plunge widely, so that the driver had to hold them up. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants and a universal crossing of themselves, a cliché with four horses drove up behind us, overtook us, and drew up beside the coach. I could see from the flash of our lamps as the rays fell on them that the horses were coal black and splendid animals. They were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat, which seems to hide his face from us. I could only see a gleam of a pair of very bright eyes, which seemed red in the lamplight as he turned towards us. He said to the driver, You are early tonight, my friend, the man stammered in reply. The English hare was in a hurry, to which the stranger replied. That is why I suppose you wish me to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much and my horses are swift. As he spoke, he smiled and the lamplight fell on the hard-looking mouth. With very red lips and sharp-looking teeth, as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to another line from Berger's Lenore. Den die toten. Written Chanel. For the dead travel fast. The strange driver evidently heard the words, for he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned his face away at the same time, putting out two fingers and crossing himself. Give me the hare's luggage, said the driver. And with exceeding alertity, my bags were handed out and put in the Clashé. Then I descended from the side of the coach as the cliché was close alongside. The driver helping me with a hand which caught me with in a grip of steel. His strength must have been prodigious. Without a word, he shook his reins and the horses turned as we swept into the darkness of the pass. As I looked back, I saw the steam from the horses of the coach by the light of the lamps and projected against it the figures of my late companions crossing themselves. Then the driver cracked his whip and called to his horses, and off they swept on their way to Bukovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill, and a lonely feeling came over me. The cloak was thrown over my shoulder and rug across my knees, and the driver said, Excellent German, the night chill." The night is chill, mein Herr, and my master, the Count, bade me take all care of you. There is a flask of Slivitz, the plum brandy of the country, underneath the seat, if you should require it. I did not take any, but it was a comfort to know it was there all the same. I felt a little strangely and not a little frightened. I think, had there been any alternative, I should have taken it instead of prosecuting that unknown night journey. The carriage went at a hard pace straight along, then we made a complete turn and went along another straight road. It seemed to me that we were simply going over and over the same ground again, and so I took note of the salient point and found that this was so. I would have liked to ask the driver what this all meant, but I really feared to do so, for I thought that, placed as I was, any protest would have no effect in case there had been intention to delay. By and by, however, as I was curious to know how time was passing, I struck a match and by its flame looked at my watch. It was within a few minutes of midnight. This gave me a sort of shock, for I suppose the general superstition about midnight was increased by recent experience. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road, a long agonizing wail, as if from fear. 
The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and another, till borne on the wind, which now sighed softly through the pass, a wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country, as far as the imagination could grasp. It though it threw the gloom of the night. At first, the howl. The horses began to strain and rear, but the driver spoke to them soothingly, and they quieted down. But shiver and sweat as though after a runway from a sun fright. Then far off in the distance from the mountains on each side of us began louder and sharper howling. I have wolves which affected the horse and myself in the same way. For I was minding to junk fr jump from the clashé and run whilst they reared again and plunged madly so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting. In a few minutes, however, my own ears got accustomed to the sound, and the horses so far became quiet that the driver was able to descend and to stand before them. He petted and soothed them and whispered something in their ears, as I have heard of horse tamers doing, and with extraordinary effort for under his caress they became quite manageable again. Though they still trembled, the driver began again took his seat and shaking his reins, stir off at a great pace. This time after going to the far side of the pass, he suddenly turned down a narrow roadway, which ran sharply to the night. Soon we were hemmed in with trees, which in places arched right over the roadway, till we pass as, as through a tunnel and again great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. Though we were in shelter, we could hear the rising wind for a moan and whistle. Through the rocks and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered with a white blanket. The keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs, though this grew fainter as we went our way. The bang of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing around on us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid, and the horses shared my fear. The driver, however, was not in the least disturbed. He kept turning his head to left and right, but I could see nothing through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw a faint flickering blue flame. The driver saw at the same moment. He at once checked the horses, and jumping to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do, unless the howling of the wolves grew closer, but while I wondered, the driver suddenly appeared again, and with our word, took his seat, and we resumed our journey. I think I must have fallen asleep, and kept dreaming at the instant, for it seemed to be repeated endlessly, and now looking back, it is like a sort of awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared so near the road that even the darkness around us, I could watch the driver's motions. He went rapidly to where the blue flame arose. It must have been very faint, for it did not seem to illumine the place around it, and gathering a few stones formed them into some device. Once there appeared a strange optical effect, when he stood between me and the flame, he did not struck it, for I could see a ghostly flicker all the same. This startled me, but as this effect was only momentary, I took it that my eyes deceived me, straining through the darkness. Then for a time there was no blue flames, and we sped onwards through the gloom. With the howling of the wolves around us, as though they were falling, in a morning circle. At last there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had yet gone, and during his absence the horses began to tremble worse than ever and to snort and scream with fright. I could see 
not see any cause for it, for the howling of the wolves has ceased altogether. But, just as the moon sailing through the black clouds appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling pine-clad rock, and by its light I saw around us a ring of wolves, with white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. They were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence, which held them than ever when they held for myself, I fell sore a paralysis, a fear. It is only when a man feels himself face to face with such horrors that he can understand their true import. All at once the wolves began to howl as though the moonlight had some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared and looked helplessly round with eyes that rolled in a way painful to see. But the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had to perform, per, perforce to remain within it. I called the coachman to come, for it seemed to me that the only chance was to try to break out through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of Kalshay, helping by the noise to scare the wolves from the side so as to give me a chance of reaching the trap. How he came there, I know not, but I heard the voice raise in a tone of imperious command, and looked towards the sound, saw him stand on the roadway, as he swept his long arms as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacles. The wolves fell back and back further still. Just then a heavy cloud passed across the man's face, across the face of the moon, so that we were again in darkness. When I could see again the driver was climbing into the couch, and the wolves had disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny that a dreadful, a dreadful fear came upon me. I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed interminable as we swept our way, now almost complete darkness for the rolling crowd, clouds obscured the moon. We kept on ascending with occasional periods of quick descent, but in the main always ascending. Suddenly I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in fact pulling up the horses into a courtyard of a vast ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light and whose broken battlements showed a ragged line across the moonlit sky. And that is where we are going to leave off until next time. Hope you enjoyed yourselves, and thanks for listening.